Thank you, uh, Christy. That was, uh, that was beautiful. It's kind of a uh, good evening. Um, it's kind of uh, that peace that we all just felt right there. It's way different than what we feel when we go out there, isn't it? Especially today, right, in the political environment that we're in right now. It's a little stressful, to say the least. And we're going we're gonna to get into that a little bit. Uh, I first have an announcement. Um, everybody knows what's going on next Tuesday, voting day. If you do not have a ride and you would like to get a ride, get a hold of Joel Labby and sign up. There is a card out at the information booth where you take the card and then you can sign up for a ride. Is that correct? Okay, the van ministry card. Use that, okay? Do you realize that uh, only uh, uh, 40% of Christians actually vote? And one of the sad things is um, we like to blame what's going on out in society. This party did this, that party did this. It's more about what the church hasn't done. We've stayed here in our holy huddles because who wants to get involved in that mess out there, right? Nobody would really desire to go do that. But it's important that we do it. You have that right. You have that freedom. Um, I encourage you to exercise it. Let's, uh, let's pray in before we get too far. Uh, Father God, we want to give um, this evening to you everything about it, from the worship to the teaching, to the fellowship, to the prayer. Father, we give it all to you because it's all about you. Our purpose is to bring you glory. That's why we were created. So I ask that you lead us tonight in that mission in Jesus' name. You know, I don't know how many current or ex-news junkies are there out there, right? Okay. How many of you wanted to throw something at the television? <laughs> right? I mean, right? You hear a story, and you just can't even believe it, right? I mean, some of the stories that you hear, you think, man, I, I think my three-year-old would know better than that and could answer that question. It makes no sense. And just obvious lies from both sides. It, it, it's just so frustrating. You just go, ah, why don't they see it? Why don't they understand it? I see it. My three-year-old sees it. Why can't everybody else see it? We're going we're gonna to figure out what the answer to that is tonight. Um, open your Bibles up, please, to 1 Romans 1.18. Did you put that title up there? Don't worry, be happy. Anybody remember that dumb song, right? Don't yeah. worry, be happy, right? Okay, calm down, Arthur, calm down. Um, that, you know, that is like a um, pretty dumb song, but... In this day and age, what I want to do is to encourage you not to worry and to be happy, right? Christ tells us to be filled with joy. Not happiness, but joy. Joy through cancer. Joy through financial difficulties. Joy through all the trials and tribulations that come before us. In fact, when we've reached a certain place in our walk, we should have the ability to go, Praise you, Jesus. Thank you for this trial. That sounds bizarre, doesn't it? But we, we know what he's going to do with that trial. Right? It's like the pressing of, of grapes to make some really fine wine. Sometimes we need to be crushed and refined to make something really sweet and nice. So that's how we can give thanks. All right, we're at Romans 118. God does not overlook sin. And this is the amplified version. So if you see it stretched out a little bit, um, very similar to what you might see in the NIV, but a little different. 
For God does not overlook sin, and the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who in their wickedness suppress and stifle the truth. One of the big things that I've tried to discipline myself to do is I used to read through the Word so that I could get through it in 365 days. Check, I did it, I did it, I did it, I did it. How much of it did I comprehend? Just a little bit, because I had to get through it. And it took me years to stop. I'm not going any farther until I understand this. So I started looking up words. I started looking up historical timelines. I started looking up geographical places. And maybe I only read one verse, but I went away full of understanding what that verse is about. Very important to do that. So I want to break out a couple things that's in this verse because there, there are several things in here. First of all, slide two, um, let's talk about wrath. There are, MacArthur uh, breaks out five different types of wrath. Because it says here, what does it say? He, um, for God does not overlook sin, and the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all godliness. So this wrath is coming. Well, what does that look like? Well, we have, it, we have eternal wrath. If you refuse Jesus Christ, your wrath is hell. We have eschatological wrath. That's a big one. I was lucky I get that out. That's the day of the Lord. That's the judgment day of the Lord. We have catechismic wrath. The flood of Noah. Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed by fire. The end times and tribulation. Egypt. All of the judgments that came down upon them. Those are cataclysmic wrath. Conse consequential wrath. It's like sowing and reaping, cause and effect. If you eat too much pizza Friday night till you're stuffed to the gills, you're probably going to get ill. Well, we can do that in our things that we live out in our life. The sin that we choose is going to have consequences behind it. And then we have abandoning wrath. And that's kind of like what I want to focus on tonight, abandoning wrath. Let's define, there's another uh, term in here called ungodliness. We want to know, well, what, what is this? We've, we've dealt with wrath, and now we're talking about he's going to judge against ungodliness. Well, ungodliness can be defined as God watching you sin and sin and sin, and he steps back and he just lets you go unto your own sin and you become ungodly. The definition is lack of devotion and reverence towards God after he has given us over to our sinful life. Well, the next thing to follow after ungodliness is unrighteousness. So ungodliness happens first. You just sin, sin, sin. God says, just go. Now you become unrighteous. The result of ungodliness, lack of conformity of thought, word and deed to the character and the law of God. To your ungodly first, then you come, become unrighteous. So God says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, we know wrath, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who in their wickedness suppress the truth. What truth? What is truth? Right? We're all about fact-checking. Right? We're going to run this in the debate and fact-check this guy and fact-check this girl. We're fact-checking everything. Well, okay, against what? You know there is an absolute truth? One of the problems in society is that we, we've been taught to accept the relative truth. Your truth is your truth, and your truth is your truth. Your truth might be different than my truth. Wait a minute. That's one of those logical things, like how can that even be? There has to be. Truth. Well, there is an absolute truth. There's actually three different ones. One, in your conscience, when God knit you together in your mother's womb, he gave you moral law. It's been planted right in your brain. You know right from wrong immediately from the first day that you were born. Okay, so that's in our consciousness. Then there's creation. 
You walk outside, you go to your favorite stream, up on your favorite mountain, your favorite lake, your favorite park to walk in, and you just sit down and you look at everything that God created. You go out at night. Anybody, um, you must have all seen the, um, uh, the roar borealis. Man. Why, why did that even happen? Why was that of such beautiful and amazing colors? For our enjoyment, for our pleasure. And you lay there and you look at all of the stars and just imagine. So now we have physical evidence that God exists. We have him in our mind through our consciousness of moral law. And then what do we have? We have God's word. The Holy Spirit. That, that is a spiritual truth. So we have three different truths going on. We have moral law that's inside our conscious. We have physical truth, and then we have spiritual truth. Please go to um, slide 6, uh, Romans 19 through 21. Because that which is known about God is evident, right? We've just established that, right? We just established that, we, so when you walk through the Bible and in your faith, you have building blocks. So when you go on to a new topic, you don't like reset yourself and start learning over again. You take what you read earlier, and that's how the Bible reinforces itself. That's one of the problems when you take things out of context in the Bible. The Bible is, a, it's <laughs> it is so well intertwined that it's a building block one upon another. So we've already established that this, is, that this is true. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, in their conscience that I talked about. For God made it evident to them. Now this is where I'll stop, and if you've been in my journey group or listened to me at a men's breakfast speak, that word of God, which is on my phone, it's either all true or none of it's true. You have to have that attitude. Because if it's none of it's true, why read it? If only some of it's true, why read it and develop a belief system from it? So you got to go all in and say all of it's true. Some of it's parable. Some of it's allegory. Some of it is factual, hard evidence, science. It, it approaches all of our disciplines. So I say it's all true. So when it tells me something, I don't have to understand it. I don't have to understand all of it. And I don't have to understand it because there are so many things that I do understand. There's so many things that I did apply to my life, and they all prove to be true, so therefore, this thing that I don't understand or how it happened or how it could be, I'm just going to go with it. And God will reveal it to me when I need to know about it. And a lot of things in Scripture were designed for us to be able to ponder upon, to think about. It wasn't just a hard, here's the answer. He revealed everything to us that, that we need to know at the time that we're reading it. Right? It's like an onion. Take one layer off the onion the first time. And then the next time we read it, we go a little deeper. We go a little deeper. We go a little... And that goes on until the day we die. I've heard some preachers preach, when we get to heaven someday, we're just going to sit around and continue to learn about how he did and why he did everything that he did. There's just so much. That's kind of cool. For ever since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through his workmanship, all his creation, the wonderful things he has made, so that they who fail to believe and trust in him are without excuse and without defense. Oh, I just don't believe in God. I mean, I, I, you know, I, that, putting this whole earth together and, and a, a virgin baby that's a messiah that died on a cross and a giant flood this that's all just too much for me it's just too much i can't get my head around that this is we we came out of ooze that's what happened there was a big bang theory and we just developed from a 
bunch of oohs. Well, it says, Scripture says, all who fail to believe and trust him are without excuse. No excuse. You have no excuse and without defense. For, and this is the sad part. So you have a conscience that's telling you. You have creation that's showing you. You have the Holy Spirit-inspired word that's talking to you. For even though they knew God as the creator, they did not honor him or give him thanks for his wonderful creation. On the contrary, they became worthless in their thinking, godless with pointless reasoning and silly speculations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Whew. We see a lot of that. I'm going to go into that a little bit more uh, as we go on. Um, it's starting to explain a little bit about why that person on the news who's speaking or public speaker that is out there that that really doesn't make sense. Why? Well, Scripture says right here, they became worthless in their thinking. Godless. With Check. Pointless reasoning and silly speculations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Let's quickly just jump to some evidence of creation. We can go to um, Psalms 19, 1 through 8. The heavens are telling the glory of God. Huh? We saw that during the Borealis, right? Northern Lights. And the expanse of heaven is declaring the work of his hands. I always like to, I like to chuckle when I hear people go, well, we're going to explore space. Really? Really? Space is so big and so infinite, we can't even get anywhere with our very best rocket ships and everything to explore space. That expanse is so huge. Day after day pours forth a speech. Those stars speak to us. And night after night re reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor there are spoken words from the stars. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice in quiet evidence has gone out through all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In them and in the heavens he has made a tent for the sun which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as, as a strong man to run its course. The sun's rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord's perfect flawlessness, restoring and refreshing the soul, the statutes of the Lord are reliable and trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure and lightning to the eyes. Let's go to Acts 14, 15 through 17. Men, why are you doing these things? We too are only men of the same nature as you, bringing the good news to you, so that you turn from these useless and meaningless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and the sea and everything that is in them. That's a statement right there. It's either all true or none of it's true. Who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them. In generations past, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without some witness as evidence of his self in that he kept constantly doing good things and showing you kindness and giving you rains from heaven and productive seasons, filling your hearts with food and happiness. No matter how we responded to him, even though those that choose not to follow him, God is full of what? Grace. He's got a lot of grace for us. And we begin to learn as we accept Jesus and walk with him and abide in him. Today, his grace is even more important to me than it was the day that he brought salvation to me after living a very wild and disrespectful and retarded lifestyle. He's, he gave me grace to get me to come to the cross. So I thought, well, okay, good. I had all that grace. Grace is over. I'm done. I'm saved. Well, it's just the beginning. 
because you know it's, it's <laughs> are we are we just happy to be saved or do we really want our lives to be changed do we want to be done with the depression and anxiety do you want that gone in your life do you want anger gone in your life you want addictions gone afflictions gone do you really want that you definitely want that right but in order to do that, you need to make him Lord. Do we hear Pastor Doug, Doug talk about it? Is Jesus just your friend? Is he just your buddy? Is he just your Savior? Or is he the Lord of your life? When we surrender our lives daily, <laughs> minute by minute, what begins to happen is that we actually start to become transformed. We allow the power of the Holy Spirit that is in us to work through us and become evident. That's a beautiful thing. I believe that you can choose not to make him Lord. That's my opinion. You can say, well, you're not going to be my Lord, but I believe in you. You died on the cross. I'm grateful for that. I'm thankful for that. But I think you live, you do not live, um, you don't begin to live heaven on earth. You can have a much better life, even though this life is, can be miserable, you can have a, a joyous, miserable, ex, ex, you can have a joyous life on a miserable earth, if that makes sense. Or you can choose not to accept Jesus at all, and you can have a miserable life on a miserable earth. Or you can accept Jesus but not surrender 100% and make him Lord, and you can have an okay life on a miserable earth, still keeping to the afflictions and the stuff that you had. But he keeps pursuing. That's one of the things that this scripture refers to. He keeps coming after you until a point. Let's talk about, there was two things that were, um, that were brought up in here. One of them was, um, was um, divine nature. In Exodus, so remember we talked about his, uh, what was his uh, eternal power, right? The, back when I was looking at Romans 1.19, he talked about eternal power. Well, that eternal power was evident in that creation, right? <laughs> I made earth. I can do a flood. I can do all of this stuff. We can, we can see that. But this other one, divine nature, what, what is God's divine nature? Well, in Exodus 34.6, Moses was up on the mountain, saw the burning bush, and he says, Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, parentheses, faithfulness. So that's his divine nature, right? What would if somebody asked, were to write down on a piece of paper what your divine nature was? How would you describe your divineness? It might not be compassionate. Compassionate, it might be. It might not be gracious. It might be. It might be slow to anger. It might not be. And abounding in loving kindness. It might be, might not be and faithfulness. Those are his, that's his divine nature. I like to go back when it's talking about without excuse. As a result of the indisputable truth, we have no, we have no excuse. If you have undisputable truth, like if I kick that speaker, my foot's going to hurt, that's an undisputable truth. So I have, to, I have to accept that. If I kick that, that's going to hurt. Well, we were just told of all the things that we have, the consciousness, the, create, the, the uh, creation, and the Holy Spirit. So that's the undisputable truth. So therefore, you have no excuse. Now, some way I have to convey that to people that I run into, people that don't know, people that are searching, seeking, struggling through life. Somehow I have to tell them that, you know, your way of thinking is just a little bit off. Let me help you, show you the God that I know. 
A lot of times I'll ask people, I'll say, where did you get that thought? Right? Have we had people come up to us? And they go, blah, 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 blah. And you go. And they're passionate because they say it louder. Blah, 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 blah. Somehow thinking that that's going to convince me. And I ask them, I say, where did you get that truth? Yeah. Well, I saw it on the news. Okay. I saw it on Facebook. My college professor told me. It's all over social media. Oh, okay. He's being truthful. He, they told me where, that, where he got that thought. The next question I like to ask is, where is the evidence that supports that fact? Conversation is over at that point. Amen. The conversation is over. Most people are done. They cannot find the evidence to support their thought. So, we have the evidence. I can show you the evidence to support absolute truth. Even those who have never heard the gospel, and I love this, they go, what about the pygmy in South Africa that's never heard the gospel? What about somebody in Afghanistan in the mountains? They've never heard about Jesus. What, what, what about them? Even those who have never heard the gospel have seen creation, right? They've seen creation. Calm down. And they have consciousness of moral law. They've already got two that they can't avoid. Already two things of evidence, absolute truth. The third one is if they encounter the word of God. But they've got two of those, right? Right? Even though those who have never heard the gospel have seen his creation and have moral law instilled in them, if they simply recognize these truths, God will provide a way for the gospel. And this can go back, you can take this back 4,000 years, you can take it back 50 years. If I just begin to understand that it's not all about me, there's something bigger than me and more important than me that made this. If you think about, here's a question that you might want to ask somebody. Where did thought come from? How did that evolve? That had to be put in you. So if you're any kind of thinking person all, at all that lay in bed or watch the stars and stuff like that, you begin to think there's more to this than just what I think in me. As soon as you start to do that, God's going to start putting people in your path, things in your path. And crazy things as far as Jesus walking through a wall. That's happening in, um, in the Muslim countries all over the world. Nobody can go there. Nobody can go into a closed country with the word of God. <laughs> Jesus says, I'll just show up <laughs> to a wall. I'd like to see that. But God says, I don't need to because I have the word of God in my hand. But he will use circumstances and people to bring them to him. Let's go to um, uh, Romans 1, through 23. This scripture I absolutely love this uh, verse here. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory and majesty and excellence of the immortal God for an image, worthless idols, in the shape of mortal man and birds and four-footed animals and reptiles. Man, think about this. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Okay. This is a part of the abandoning wrath. God said, you chose sin. You want to stay in, you want to stay in sin? <laughs> okay. 
That's a beautiful thing about our God, right? He doesn't force you to believe in him. We have some people on the street that try to do that to you, Bible bullies. You go to hell. Okay, okay, back off. You know what I mean? But he doesn't force us to believe in him. So, I'm going to turn you over. You don't want anything to do with me? Okay, okay. So now the, you have a negative progression that begins to happen inside of you. Claiming to be wise, they came, became fools. I'm becoming foolish. I'm not waking up going, I think I'll be a fool today. Nobody does that. I think I'm going to get number. Nobody does that. But it's, a, but it's a cause and effect thing. If I choose to reject God and not believe in him, my process will become, I begin to be a fool. And I love to watch the, the news and, you know, we do a news story and what comes next? The think tank. We'll bring five of us together. And they have all of these buzzword names about uh, how, you know, something to do with being smart. And they just go blah, 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 back and forth, all doing their opinion. And it's foolishness. It's foolishness, but they think they're so smart, and they write all these books and everything, and they don't even, that's a cool thing, they don't even know they're fools. See, I used to get mad at them, right? I'd take off my shoe, and I'd throw it at the TV. I said, you're an idiot. You're an idiot. Right? Everybody can see that a boy is not a girl, and a girl is not a boy. I mean, come on. No, no, I really am. I, I really am, or this really is. Yeah, but it doesn't make any sense. No, 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 it does. Look, I got all these books. I wrote this book. I got all this stuff. They don't even know. They don't even know. Just as if when Jesus was crucified, right? He said, Lord, forgive them because they don't even know what they're doing. They don't even know they're fulfilling prophecy and this is what's supposed to happen and I'm supposed to be here and I'm glad to be here. They don't even know what they do. And I think we see that today in our schools, and in our government. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. It wasn't by choice. It was by default. I even take it to the point where we, we, we have a lot of Bible teachings on sanctification. And we know sanctification means being set apart. Okay. I like to use a term called desanctification. I am either going towards God or I'm going away. I might pause for a second right here, but I don't stay there very long. I'm either going towards him or away from him. So if I'm at the point where God is giving me over to wrath from abandonment where he's done, which way do you think I'm going? I'm going this way. I'm being set apart this way. I like to think of it as reversed transformation, right? We all want Jesus to change us more into his image. Well, if I've rejected him, he's abandoned me, I'm being transformed. I don't have control of that. I didn't wake up and go, oh, I think I'll transform in a negative direction. N nobody would purposely do that. But because I ignored him, I became a fool. And that's the path that I'm on. And as a result of that, things start to go bad. The other thing I like to think about um, along that same lines is we want, to prove, we want to show the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Right? Everybody wants to have that, right? That fruit of the Holy Spirit is is the Holy Spirit in us. Love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, and self-control. That is the Holy Spirit. Arthur. The Holy Spirit, as we surrender more and more, that Holy Spirit comes forward and is more prominent in our life. And if he's more prominent, don't you think people can see that fruit in us? They can see that fruit in us. 
It's not like, I'm going to attain patience. I'll work on that this month, and I'm going to pay about patience. I'm going to pray about goodness. I'm going to pray about self-control. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruits. It's not apples, oranges, pears, bananas, grapefruit. It's the fruit, not of Andrew. I'm not making this. It's the fruit of the Spirit. So the more we surrender, the more that that can come forward. Putting it into the reverse category with desanctification, reverse transformation, I call it rotten fruit. <laughs> rotten fruit. You can have a lot of people run up to you and go, ah, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. And you look at their life. You look at their fruit. It's rotten. They might as well go stand in a garage and say, I'm a car. It doesn't make them a car just because I claim it. I'm going to look. No, you don't look like a car to me. Now, we have to be careful with judgment, but we're told we're allowed to be fruit inspectors. So when you're out there professing that you love Jesus, you might want to have some self-examination about yourself, being honest with yourself. Okay, let's go to slide number 12. That is Romans 24. Therefore, God gave them over to their lusts of their own hearts. So I told you how they start to go crazy, becoming a fool, to their own hearts, sexual impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among, ab abandoning them to degrading power of sin. Because by choice, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creator rather than the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So let me do that again. Therefore, God gave them over in lusts of their own hearts to sexual impurity, so their bodies would be dishonored among them, abandoning them to degrading power of sin. Because by choice they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. We worship ourselves. Idols is ourselves. We worship ourselves in the form of men and women who become idols. We worship rock stars, movie stars, TV personalities, social media stars, sports teams, and athletics, and we desire to worship Mother Earth. That's what happens when we become of foolish minds, when God abandons us. A side note on that, if you look, if you look at this country, to the best of its ability, it was founded as a godly nation. There was a, there's a lot of godly men that sat to put our government documents together that founded this country. They weren't all Christians, but the majority was. This country was full of a lot of church-going men and women. And then slowly but surely, we began to turn away from that. But, but before that happened, we won World War I. We won World War II. We survived a great depression. We became the wealthiest nation on the earth with the greatest resources and the largest giver of money and, and services and love to the rest of the world. This country was just unbelievable. Was it because we were smarter? No. People are just as smart today as they were in Adam's day. Adam had the same IQ, the same genius as we are today. So it wasn't because we were smarter. It was because we were blessed by a majority of people that honored God. And then we said, the 60s rolls around. 
my generation, the hippies, let's have some free love, let's have some free drugs, let's fight authority. We can't have God telling us what to do. Get him out of our schools, get him out of our city halls, get him out of our government. Some places get him out of our churches. So we chose as a nation to turn our back and walk away. What's going to happen? The same thing that we read right there. He says, okay, okay. I kind of see God's hand sometime in the beginning just covering the earth, covering our nation, protecting it. War, pestilence, depression, uh, just bad uh, enemies coming against us, economic collapse. And God's going like this. No, these are, these are my people. I read somewhere that the United States and Israel are the only two countries in the world that made a covenant with God. So we're protected. Remember, the battle is not against flesh and blood, but evil powers, principalities, and wickedness in the spiritual realm. That stuff is coming at you all the time. You can choose not to believe it. I don't believe in that stuff, you know. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't believe that. Ow, if I kick that, it's going to hurt, right? It's going to. That enemy's coming at us all the time. So now we give God the middle finger. He's going, okay, okay. Takes his hand off. And now you're watching this country fall into insanity because of it. But there's a remnant. We are that remnant. People coming on a Wednesday night, coming on Sundays, involving themselves in ministry. We love Jesus. We love the message that he has, and we know he is the only hope for this world. So we're going to fight for that. So that's, we're a remnant. Romans 1, 26 through 27. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading and vile passions. I mean, that's about as explicit as you can get, right? For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural, a function contrary to nature. And in the same way, also, the men turned away from natural function of the women and were consumed with their desire towards one another. Men with men committing shameful acts and in return receiving in their own bodies the inevitable and appropriate penalty for their wrongdoing. I don't think they got up. I don't think people just woke up naturally and go, I want to change my sex. I want to love a man. I want to love a woman. I, I don't think that was, I believe that that was part of this whole downgrading. I was just thinking, right? Well, I'm going to upgrade my model of my car. Well, when you choose to reject Jesus Christ, you've, you've, you've chosen to downgrade. And it's a natural thing. That's what's cool about it. It happens subliminal. You don't even know what's going on. It's just, it's just happening. Romans uh, 1, 28-31. This is in the English uh, Standard Version. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, I love this. This is really the anchor here for me in this, in this whole Romans. God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. A debased mind. They were filled with all manners of unrighteousness, evil, covetedness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They were gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil. Inventors of evil. How many times do we watch the news and we go, huh? How can it get worse than this? And then next month, huh? How can it get worse than that? They invent evil. Why? Because this is what the word said was going to happen. I didn't write it. I didn't make the rules. This is what God said is the byproduct. Disobedient to parents. Foolish. Faithless. Heartless. Ruthless. We seeing any of that this year during the campaign season? No, none of that. 
Let's go back to this word debase. This, this word debase means without foundation. Without a foundation. Ever try to build a house without a foundation? Ever try to build anything with a foundation? What happens? It falls down, right? Well, Jesus is our foundation. We all know that. We've all been taught that. But it also means, if you look into the Christian standard Bible, they use the word worthless. The mind became worthless. In Amplified, the mind became depraved. And in King James and the NIV, it says reprobate. So do you think I wake up someday and go, well, I guess I'm going to have a reprobate mind. I'm going to do whatever sin that I'm going to do, and I do it, and I go, boy, I hope I really get a depraved mind. I hope that happens. No, you don't plan that. That's what happens. When I kick this thing enough times tonight, by tomorrow morning, I'm going to have a swollen up toe. I didn't plan to have a swollen up toe, but it was a result of kicking that thing. Maybe I ought to stop kicking it. Romans 132. Although they know God's righteous decrees and his judgment. So I've just proved my case, right? He's real, he's there, he's in you, he's undeniable. This is what's going to happen. I'm warning you, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. <laughs> even though they know all of that, the unbelievers, even though they know all that, and some of, some of the believers that continue to stay in sin, and his judgment, I know his law, and I know what's going to happen, that those who do such things deserve death, the ones with the Jesus, they're going to have a death, which means separ really separation from God for eternity. That's what, that's what they've been told. Yet, they do not only do them, but they even enthusiastically <laughs> approve and tolerate others who practice them. We see these massive parades with rainbow flags. I'm not going to just go do this sin over here. I'm going to have a big party and a big parade. I'm going to, I'm going to have a club, dance clubs, where we're going to just do the most obscene things in these clubs, and all my guys and all my buddies and gals are going to come join me at this club. I'm going to invite others to join me in my sin. And then I'm going to try to tell society that this is normal. It's normal because everybody's doing it. A red flag goes up to me. If I see something that hits society, that everybody's in on, and they think it's the best thing, the newest thing, the coolest thing that's happened because everybody's doing it, red flags go up to me and go, whoa, whoa. I need to look at this, and I need to pray about this before I get involved in it. It might be a movie. It might be a song. It might be a gathering. It might be a thought. Whoo. So there's that warning. So I ask, you go, Andy, aren't we seeing all that stuff right now? Aren't we seeing that all right now? And this was written 2,000 years ago. Romans, aren't we seeing that right now? And I ask the question, are we getting close? Are we getting close? Are we in the final days? I heard a wonderful preacher this week goes, oh, we've heard him, we, people say, We've heard you talk about end times forever. Don't you think the Jews and the Holocaust thought that was end days? Didn't World War II look like end days? Haven't we seen end days forever? I think that what might have happened, I have no proof for this, is just a thought of mine. That society, after Christ left the earth, has been walking, let's see if I do this right. I've been walking towards end times, end days, I got here, and now I've been walking parallel. I've been walking parallel to the very last days. It's not going to take long to take one step, and I'm there. We may not be on a linear approach to end days. We may be on the edge of it. So if we look at um, Mark 13, 6 through 8, he warns, many will come in my name, misusing my name. We see that in churches today. And claiming to be the Messiah, saying, I am he. And will deceive and mislead many. Churches of 30, 40,000 people 
When you hear of wars, okay, yeah, we've heard that. We've been hearing that for a long time. That's my parallel walk thing, right? When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed, frightened, or troubled. These things must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places, hurricanes. <laughs> there will be famines. These things are, be are the beginning of birth pains, the intolerable anguish and suffering. So we've been seeing that in mankind for 2,000 years. One of the key things in, in, in looking towards end times, it's not that these things are happening, but it, they happen in frequency and intensity. Are the wars getting bigger? Are, are the falling away in man getting greater? Are the, are the, are the earthquakes getting stronger? Are the wars getting bigger? So, so that's a warning sign. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But understand this, that in the last days, dangerous times of great stress and trouble will come. Difficult days that will be hard to bear. For people will be lovers of self, narcissistic, self-focused. I think there's a presidential candidate who might be out there. Lovers of money, impelled by greed, boastful, arrogant, um, revelers, disobedience to parents, ungrateful, unholy, and profane. And they will be unloving, devoid of natural human affection, calloused, inhumane, um, irric um, Somebody pronounce that word for me. Irreconcilable. irreconcilable. <laughs> Malicious gossips. Devoid of self-control. Intemperate, immoral, brutal, haters of good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of sensual pleasures rather than lovers of God. Holding to a form outward of godliness and religion, although they have denied its power, for they con conduct nullness, their claim of faith. Christian, pay attention. Holding a form of outward godliness, although they have denied the power, for their conduct nullifies their claim of faith. Avoid such people and keep away from them. Man, aren't we seeing that? Aren't we seeing that intensified? I just came from, I flew home from Alabama. And as I walked through the airport, thousands of people coming at me. And I'm purposely looking for eye contact with somebody. Thousands. They're all walking like this. Or they're walking like this. Or they're walking like this. We do not know how to socialize any longer. When you go through the checkout line, when we do anything out in the community, people are short with, them, with you. Their anger goes just like that. They honk their horns in their cars. They're rude to you at the supermarket. They don't know how to communicate. COVID, what a tool of the devil. Let's take all these people. Let's take these kids out of school. Let's keep everybody isolated. And now let's bring them back together. And then we have politicians that are tearing the nation apart and, and making divisions amongst black and white and, and just forgetting God's love for everybody and just dividing us all up. And now I'm supposed to have a conversation with a stranger? I'm scared to death of you. Yeah. I'm not going to look at you. I'm going to keep to myself. Satan wins. Satan wins. But again, this behavior of being calloused is this byproduct of turning away from God. They can't help it. They can't help it. I, so I look at the news now and I look at people that are in that state and I said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know you. They don't know you. That's a pretty depressing picture, right? Man, how can we have any hope in that? Well, let's go to uh, Isaiah 41.10. So in the, in the midst of this world that's turned its back, that God has turned over 
And all of this stuff is happening. World full of people with debased minds. God says, do not fear anything, for I am with you. Man. Ah, that little four-year-old boy that's out back got turned around in his backyard. And he's scared. I don't know how to get home. Nothing around here looks familiar. And then over here, he, he hears his father go, Hey, don't worry, I'm with you. That's how I feel when I start focusing on this world around me. I know he's with me. Do not be afraid, he tells me, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Be assured I will help you. I will certainly take hold of you with my righteous hand, a hand of justice, of power, of victory, and salvation. Okay. I can get through this. I can do it. Not on my own, but through you. I can do all things through Christ because he's got me by the hand. John 14, 27, he says, Peace I leave with you. Not stress, not anxiety, not fear. He says, Peace I leave with you. My perfect peace I give you. Not as words, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. Let my perfect peace calm you in every circumstance and give you courage and strength for every challenge. Not just some challenges, every challenge. That perfect peace is like that last song that that Christy did. Man, just sit and bathe in the peace of the Holy Spirit. That's way better than being cranked up by what's out there in the debased world telling me how to think, encouraging me to be afraid, Satan talking in my ear, cranking me up. No, I claim that perfect peace because he said it's in the world. He said said it in the word inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it's either all true or none of it's true. I, I choose to accept that that he's with me, that he'll strengthen me, that he'll protect me, and that he'll give me peace. I'm going to own that. I'm going to own it. Own it, Christian. Don't just go, well, that's just for you, Andy. You don't realize I'm going through this and this and this and this. No, it didn't say that anywhere here. And finally, um, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. What's our job? What do we do in the midst of all this? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Help the people to learn of me, believe of me, and obey my words. Help the people learn of me, Christian, in your workplace, in your family, in your home, in the marketplace. Help the people learn of me. Help them to believe in me. And help them to obey me. We're, we're told, brothers and sisters, if we see somebody who's weak in the church, maybe his faith or their faith is not as strong as yours. Maybe they fall down sometimes. We're told to help the weak. So this is what it's telling us here. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstance, and on every occasion, even to the end of the age. You want to live a victorious life? You want to start living your heaven right now? You want to beat the demons of anxiety, depression, anger, anger, addiction, and affliction? I'll preach it forever and ever. John 16, we need to abide. We need to abide. And it's not a buzzword. It can be thrown around pretty easy. Abide, 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 abide. No, wait a minute. Abide. Abide says, come alongside Jesus and stay with him. That means Sunday when the service is over, (laughs) see you, Jesus. I'll see you next week. 
Oh, wait a minute. I'll stop back in Wednesday night. Hi, Jesus. I'm here. Aren't I good? Okay, see you Sunday. So often we live that cycle. I had the best compliment ever from one of our daughters. Came here from, uh, I won't say, came to the house. And one day she was so frustrated, she says, you guys, you know being here is like being in church 24-7. At first it was like, ouch. <laughs> Too much Jesus? Really? Am I, maybe I am. But then it began to sink in. And I said, praise God. Praise God. I was just with 12 men in Alabama. 12 men. These staff leaders for influencers. And these guys, very accomplished, loved the Lord. We were together 24 hours a day for five days. When you get around men, most men what? We're going to talk about sports. We're going to talk about hunting, fishing, UFC. <laughs> These guys talk Jesus almost 24 hours for five days. They're from the South, so football's pretty big in the South. You know, we don't have any scale of football team like they have in the South. No. It's like NFL down there to them, college football. A little bit of that. A little bit of that. But it was more like, hey, you know, I read this in Scripture. Um, how, do we, how do we deal with that? What do you think that means? How do you process that? Or oh, we're reaching into one another's soul. Brother, how are you doing? How can I help you? How can I pray for you? How can I be more effective in my church? How can I help, um, how can I help uh, lift up and feed fellow believers? How can I help protect them from the attacks of the enemy and the things that they're going through in their life? Man, when you can live that 24-7, you can put that front title back up, page one. You can actually not worry and be happy. Maybe scratch the happy and put joy. My family and in my life, we've been through a lot of stuff. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of hard stuff. Some stuff so hard that if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, I'd been hanging in a garage. But I could walk through that with a peace that had me going, what are you, crazy, Andrew? Well, you're not supposed to be calm. You're supposed to be freaking out. You're supposed to be mad at God. You're supposed to be destroyed emotionally. And I'm like, chill. I've had many situations, many crises that that, that peace that passes all understanding is real. It goes back to just what he said. If you claim it, you own it, and you surrender, it's conditional. You don't surrender, you don't get to get the benefits. Sorry. This life is hard. I don't, I don't want it to be any harder than it has to be. I want to, you know, the Staples easy button. Jesus, Jesus Christ abiding and surrendering, that's the easy button. You choose that, and it'll help you walk. Hey, thank you for your time. Let's uh, wrap this up in prayer. Whew. Father God, I love you. I love your word. I love your perfect plan. I don't understand all of, it, all of it. I don't know why you did all the things that you did the way that you did them. But it was your plan. And you've given us the manual. Through your Holy Spirit, you've told us how we can walk and what the benefits are. And you've told us how not to walk. Not because you want to control us, because you want the best for us, you warn us, if you do this, this will happen. And we've just seen a tremendous example of if we do this, this will happen. Because, Lord, I read Romans 1, 18 through 32, and I go, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus. I'm glad I'm watching this world blow up in front of me. 
Because if I wasn't, this book is a lie. I'm watching truth, absolute truth, being lived out before me. Lord, may we all choose to surrender, to make you Lord of our lives and our hearts. May we claim what is in this book, claim your victory, claim your love, claim your peace. What a beautiful gift. Lord, if I've said anything tonight that is not of you, would you strike it from the minds of those that sit here tonight? Father, I lift up their families. Everybody's got a a situation that they're going through. Everybody's got a story. Everybody knows somebody who's sick. Everybody knows somebody who has died. Everybody knows somebody that's going through something. Father, I ask that you, you would hear their prayers in those situations, that you would bless them, encourage them, and give them hope in a world that is just crazy. We thank you that we know you and that we love you and that you are our hope. Regardless, Father, what happens next Tuesday, Election Day, no matter who becomes the next president of the United States, you are still on the throne. You already knew. You are in control and you have a plan. Help us to be walking with you in that plan and not distracted by the noise around us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.